delegation is like next level productivity. A lot of us, we focus on personal productivity in terms of our own lives. How do I manage my time better? But no matter how effective you become with managing your own time, there's a ceiling to how much you as an individual can do. And if you really want to be effective, you need to delegate. Welcome to the Redeeming Productivity Show. This is the podcast that helps Christians get more done and get done like Christians. And I'm your host, Reagan Rose. Well, I'm excited for this episode because we're going to be talking about several different uh, subjects that are interesting, that will hopefully help you in your own personal productivity. But I'm more excited because we're changing the format slightly. In this episode, we're going to talk through a main topic like we always do. This one's going to be about delegation, um, how we should think about giving responsibility to other people. Sometimes, myself included, we can be a bit hesitant to want to hand over responsibility to people because we feel like we're shoving our work off onto somebody else. But I think the right perspective on delegation is to think of it as discipleship, and that can be true in a ministry context or even in a secular work context too. So we'll talk a bit about that. And then we're going to address a question of the week, and we're also going to give you a productivity tip of the week. We are going to get into all of that in just a moment, but first, a quick word from this week's sponsors. Before we get into the show, I did want to let you know that our Redeeming Productivity Academy is reopening for registration at the end of this month. If you're not on the wait list for that, you should try it. It's at redeemingproductivity.com slash academy. You can learn more. Basically, the academy is a community and a set of courses, a curriculum that walks you through tons of basics of how to be more productive as a Christian. We go deep into things like morning routine. We show you how to set goals. We show you how to set up a commitment tracking system. You're doing this in the context of a community of other productivity-minded believers. It is my favorite place on the internet because we have this just awesome community of about 200 believers who are all trying to get more done for the glory of God. If you're interested in something like that, Again, registration reopening in just a couple weeks here. So get on the wait list. That'll give you early access um, because we do cap the number of new people we add. And so if you miss that window, you'll have to wait another uh, until it reopens again. So do check that out, redeemproductivity.com slash academy. Now let's get into the main topic of today's episode of the show, and that is delegation as discipleship. So I recently wrote an article for Focus on the Families Ministry called Focus on the Pastor, and it's called Delegation is Discipleship, How to Stop Being a Do-It-All Pastor. And I know that the title in the article itself is specifically geared towards pastors, but uh, I want to take some of the principles I talk about in the article and apply them a bit more broadly to anyone who might struggle with delegation. And by delegation, what I mean is, I say in the article that delegation is the simple process of empowering people to serve and evaluating them so they can improve and grow. Doing so equips your people, leads to multiplication, and creates a healthy church. Delegation is discipleship. Or another simple definition is that delegation is the act of entrusting or empowering another person to act. And I can say this from personal experience. Uh, Delegation is really, really hard for me. Really, really hard for me. Even right now, I am in the process of trying to delegate the editing of this podcast. I have two wonderful women, uh, Danny and Rebecca, who are helping me try to systematize, become a little bit more uh, effective and process-oriented with how I produce this show and some of the other stuff with Redeeming Productivity. But my goodness, it's hard. It is so hard to let stuff go. Even when I was in management roles, I had a difficult time even just handing something off to a subordinate and saying, okay, take this, run with it. This is your responsibility. (laughs) Report back to me. I'll check in with you. I often just wanted to do it myself. And if you're in any sort of leadership capacity, even if that's just leading in your family or in your home, whether you're a mother or a father, or at work, or like I say in this article, in a ministry um, profession, man, you got to learn how to give stuff to other people. That is how you become more effective. Delegation is like next level productivity. I think 
a lot of us, we focus on personal productivity in terms of our own lives. How do I manage my time better? How do I keep better track my commitments? How do I become more consistent in my habits? How do I, whatever it is, right? Set goals and reach them. But there's a cap, no matter how effective you become with managing your own time, there's a ceiling to how much you as an individual can do. And that's something I genuinely am, am just coming to terms with in my own life. I can only do so much by myself. I love the idea of being a one-man band. I love the idea of doing everything myself. Even with producing this show, I like editing it. I like doing the graphics for it. I like you know, making all of the social posts and all the little other stuff. I like that. But you come to terms with at some point in your life that there are limits to what you can do. And if you really want to be effective, you need to delegate. But that's not even the only reason. Let me talk about a couple of reasons why we fail to delegate sometimes. As vital as delegation is, there's a lot of reasons we don't do it. I think a big one is it's faster to do it yourself. That is a big one for me. I often am like, I don't have the time to pause to teach someone else how to do this. It's just easier if I do it myself. But the problem is you get stuck on this hamster wheel where it's always faster to do it yourself. And if you never actually train somebody to do it and take the time to slow down to train them, you can never get it off your plate. Other reasons are fear of relinquishing control. There's a certain way you want it to be done. And you are nervous that if you have someone else do it, maybe they're going to do it the wrong way. Or maybe it'll prove to somebody that maybe you're not as necessary. Like if this is in a work environment, you'd be like, well, if I delegate this, then maybe my boss will think that I'm not necessary or something like that, right? So there's a fear element. I, I also think uh, guilt plays a large role. I definitely, with myself, like even when I, like I said, when I worked in management roles, I felt guilty even asking the people who were my direct reports to do things, like, like they were doing me a favor when it was my job to give them work to do. And they'd be coming to me and asking me, what can you have me do? And I'm like, oh, I'll just do it all myself. It's like, that's bad management. But I think a big part of it was guilt. The sense that like, I can't give other people stuff to do. I need to be doing more. And I think that in the pastoral context, which again, that's how this article was originally written to, you feel guilty that you're the guy who's being paid by the church. And so you should do most of the work. Why would you go to volunteers? Why would you go to staff? Like you, you should be doing it all. Those are reasons that come to us. And again, even in, if you're a parent or again, in a management role, same sort of thing, this guilt, like you have this, this higher status, so you should be doing more. And the last one I said is just a lack of confidence in the abilities of those to whom you might delegate something, right? You're just not quite sure, is this person going to be able to handle it? If I hand it to them, is the ball going to get dropped? Are they going to forget what exactly is going to happen? And so what happens? Well, instead of delegating, we take on more and more responsibilities on our shoulders. Uh, we start maybe riding the edge of burnout or going into full-on burnout. Um, but I think that the, the big sort of mental shift that I've gone through when it comes to delegation is recognizing that delegation is not me just like sort of scalping my responsibilities onto other people. I'm not saying, hey, here's all my duties and how can I give them away as fast as possible so I don't have to do anything? That's not what delegation is. Delegation is really an act of discipleship. And Obviously, that makes sense in a ministry context, and we'll talk, we'll flesh this out a little bit. But I think it makes sense in the home very equally so, is when you give responsibilities to your children, you are discipling them, you're teaching them, you're letting them be trained by doing, not just by saying. Even if they can't clean up the toys as fast, that's part of the process, is that they are doing it, even if it's slower. It's not as effective, but in the long term, you're not just trying to get the toys cleaned up. You're trying to raise responsible kids. But also, even when it's not in a uh, necessarily explicitly Christian context, I think discipleship in a broad sense in that, let's say you're a manager at your job, part of your role is to build the people up under you. And you cannot do that. You will fail to do that if you don't give them responsibilities, if you babysit everything they do. There has to be this level of letting go of the reins a little bit. And that's part of your job. Delegation is discipleship. It's how you train people. You remember Jesus said when, when the student is fully trained, he will be like the master. And that's a principle he was appealing to. He was appealing to in his, his context specifically of following him. But the broader principle is just a principle of wisdom. A fully trained 
pupil will be like the master. That doesn't happen when you don't let go and let people do the thing that they need to do. So we'll talk about how to do that a little bit, but I just want to make a couple of quick arguments here about um, how delegation works as discipleship. So the first one is, I kind of just said that, but delegation equips your people. It equips people. When you give people stuff to do, you are doing the job of equipping them. Now, again, in a ministry context, this is like super, super clear. And that's why it's interesting. I know a lot of people listen to this are pastors or in full-time ministry. Very much I hear from a lot of pastors that they struggle to delegate to volunteers or staff because, you know, you kind of get that half joking, like, well, isn't that what we pay you for, pastor? Nudge, nudge. And you're like, oh, yeah, weeping and laughing. <laughs> um, but the, the funny thing is, scripturally, the pastor's role isn't to be a professional minister, to be the one who professionally does ministry. But actually, it's to teach people to do ministry or to equip them for ministry. It says this actually in Ephesians 4, 11 and 12, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. Did you catch that? He didn't give those offices to the church to do the ministry, but to equip the people for ministry. So you can see in a church context, if you're doing all of the ministry, you're actually not fulfilling your job. You're actually failing at the thing you're supposed to be doing by trying to do it all yourself. Delegation is the very thing you've been called to do. Equip people for ministry and then give them opportunities to minister. But again, I'm generalizing here out beyond just a ministry context. To equip people, you've got to let them free to do the thing. You've got to give them responsibility. I used to work with an awesome guy, Kyle Knox. We used to work together um, back in the day at the Master Seminary. And Kyle was a uh, project manager, but he was so much more than that. He had worked in the Army doing a lot of logistics, supply chain stuff um, through wars, like really amazing stuff, trying to make things run efficiently. And he was always used to tell me when it came to delegation, he would say, we would do this thing in the Army called left seat, right seat. And he said, the idea is you sit in the driver's seat and you drive for a while and you kind of let the other person who is in the other seat watch, observe ask you questions, you're showing them the ropes, and then you switch seats, and then that person is driving, that person is doing the things, and you are observing them, making comments, giving them notes, and doing that that way is the most effective way to train someone to do something. That is the act of equipping them. And I think about that a lot, that the delegation, sometimes maybe we complicate it too much. We think, okay, well, I need to like really babysit this person. I don't have time to really babysit them. Or we think, I can't delegate because I'll give it to them and I'll never follow up again. And so then maybe you do that once or twice and then you realize, well, delegation just doesn't work because I gave the person something to do and they didn't see it through. Well, you didn't left seat, right seat with them. You probably didn't actually follow up and see, how is it going? Can I give you notes? Let me observe you. There's a bit of um, investment that has to go into delegating and that investment you have to go in with the confidence that the point of this delegating isn't simply to get things off my plate, because then, right, you're going to treat it the wrong way. You're going to treat it like, well, it's it's more efficient to do it myself, because if it was just supposed to make it faster for me, it's harder for me to train this person. No, 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 no. It's not about just getting stuff off your plate. It's about equipping that person, not just in their career, not just as a volunteer church, but in their life as a person. And this is especially fruitful in the local church helping individuals to grow into their spiritual giftings. But again, it applies in a secular context too. We want to be building into people. We want to be people who aren't just solely focused on ourselves, but are focused on helping others to grow as well. And delegation is a tool that helps you to do that. The second thing is that delegation leads to multiplication. And in in the article, I talked about this again in a ministry context. Discipleship is about multiplying, right? 2 Timothy 2.2. And what you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses and trust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. There's this pattern we see in the church of multiplying discipleship. Um, The same thing is true, again, in other contexts as well. If you want to delegate to people, that's how you multiply yourself. If you've ever said to yourself, man, I wish I had like a, uh, a cloning machine. If there was two of me, then I could get so much more done. I know I've said that a lot. But the fact is there is a cloning machine and it's called delegation. But if you don't take the time, invest in a little bit of that R&D that is required to clone yourself into another person, the multiplication won't happen. You won't be able to reproduce yourself. And again, 
it's a productivity thing. You're going to be less effective overall if you're not delegating to other people. <laughs> I had a good line in this article, I think. So applying it specifically to a, uh, a church context, I said, it means trusting that the Christ who promised I will build my church doesn't need you to lay every brick yourself. Oh, that's a good line. <laughs> if I can pat myself on the back. Uh, but th- that, that is so true, man. Um, if in a church context, I know I'm flipping back and forth between church and secular context, but I think a lot of the principles apply. But if you're in the church context, you're a pastor. Dude, isn't that true? Christ is building the church, not you. You don't have to do it all yourself. You don't have to lay every brick. It's a group effort, right? The body of Christ at work. The last thing is, and this, this again, applying to church context, is delegation creates a healthy church. It's only when the people in a church are flourishing in all of their giftings that a church is truly healthy, right? In 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 27, Paul's talking about the body of Christ, and he, he gives that, that example of the eye saying to the hand, I have no need of you. I think very often that's what we're doing in our churches when we try to do it all ourselves. We're saying, I've got all the gifts. These other people, I don't need you. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Uh, and delegation is not, is not giving up your responsibilities to other people because you don't want to do them. It's letting the body of Christ flourish. Same thing, apply same principles organizationally uh, outside of a church context. You, you delegate to people because you, want, you don't want people sitting on the sidelines. You want an organization that is running really, really well with firing all cylinders. And you got to engage the cylinders to do that. Same thing with a family. Family is not uh, created by God to be, there's the parents, they do everything. And then there's the kids who you just try to keep entertained until they turn 18. I really don't think that's God's vision for the family. I think part of family is delegating your kids, even at a young age, giving them responsibilities. Your role is to clean this. Your role is to take care of the dog. You're supposed to feed him every day, right? These different things. And the older they get, you give them more responsibilities. You kind of ramp that up and you're entrusting them. You're watching them. You're giving them notes, helping to give them feedback. And what you end up with is a faithful and a fruitful and yeah, a productive home because everybody is working together. And so it's not selfish to delegate. I think that's the big thing I struggle with. And as I talk to other people, I think that's it too, is you get this idea that maybe from business books, or if you listen to other stuff on productivity, they're going to tell you to delegate. It's really common advice. Get this off of your plate. It's always the analogy, get it off of your plate. And you as a Christian who like wants to serve other people is like, why am I always shoveling stuff onto other people's plates? That seems selfish. But so we need to reframe it that delegation is not, uh, is not skimping on your own responsibilities and trying to like give them to someone else because you don't want to. Delegation is discipleship. It's how you build into people. It's how you increase their productivity, their growth. But it also does, yeah, increase your productivity too as you multiply yourself and duplicate your own skills and abilities and ways of thinking in other people. So Delegation is absolutely important. I, again, it's a lesson I'm trying to learn. I, I'm not good at it. And I'm really, that's one of the, my things this year is I, I need to get better at this. And I have people who are asking, please give us stuff to do. And, I, and I'm trying to learn to do that. So let me give you just like six quick tips on delegation. These are not coming from a master, but these are things I learned when I was working in management. And as I've studied the topic myself, and even in my own experiences, things that have worked for me. So here's a few, uh, six steps for treating delegation as discipleship. First, identify what needs to be done. This might seem obvious, but, but for a lot of people, you're like, I have too much to do. I need to give something to someone. You need to figure out exactly what that something is. What do you need to give away exactly? When you get clarity on that, the rest comes. But if you just kind of like stop at the state where I know I need to delegate and don't decide what it is, it's not going to get done. Once you decide, number two, select the best person for the job. That may mean asking around. It may be just thinking about who's available to me. It may mean being creative. But you want to be able to approach someone with a task that needs doing. Again, if it's in a family, it may be a certain child. It may even be your spouse. My wife and I, we delegate things back and forth to each other. We have like sort of our defined roles. What I'm like, I do the budgeting. She takes care of... Um, insurance stuff, bills, like appointments for doctors, all of that. Like she does all of that stuff. But sometimes if she's overwhelmed, she's saying, can you make these calls this week? 
And sometimes I'll say, can you do the budget this week, right? So we're delegating stuff to each other that is not necessarily in our main core area of responsibility or competence, but uh, that can happen in the home. And obviously this happens also um, in a workplace or in a church, but choosing who's going to do it. So you identify what needs to be done to select the person for the job, best person for the job. Three, clarify the desired result. If you have clarity on what the outcome is, again, let's apply it in a church context. If it's a volunteer, you're saying, hey, this is what we want to achieve with this. Here is what we want you to do. You're making it hyper clear. You're giving them almost a job description, even though they're volunteering for it and saying, this is the outcome we want. Then they know exactly what's expected. They know whether they want to say yes or not. And it gives them a, just a clear target to aim for. And number four, point out potential pitfalls. This will allay some of your fears um, around delegating where you're like, well, what if they can't do it as well as me? Well, why not warn them about the things that you're afraid that they might mess up, right? Let's take one of my examples for, for example, having someone edit this podcast for me. Like that's a little scary for me because I have specific ways I do stuff. I mean, it might not be great, but it's the way I like it. And so I made a little video and I sent it to Danny. I said, hey, can you watch this? And here's kind of what I do. And here's a couple things to watch out for. Here's, right? You, you point out the pitfalls. And that saves them some grief that helps you to make sure that um, things are the way it needs to be done and it saves them from getting tripped up. Number five, equip them with the resources they need. Sometimes, you know, we pray for more laborers for the harvest, but we don't give them a sickle when they show up to work. Uh, if you need help, make sure it's it an organization or a church that you give them a budget if they need one that you give them the ability or the authority to bring on volunteers or to ask other people for help right? Make sure people have what they need to do the thing well. Set them up for success. And finally, number six, after things have been delegated, you've made it really clear about what's expected and what the outcome is supposed to be. They have what they need to get it done. Well, then you set an appointment for follow-up and evaluation. This might be a time where you go and watch them. You do the left seat, right seat thing. And you say, okay, here's where you're doing great. This is awesome. Keep doing it. Double down on that stuff. This area here is how I would have done that a little different. If it can't be because of, for whatever reason, like it, maybe you're working remotely, you can't exactly do the left seat, right thing, seat thing, at least set up an appointment to talk through it um, and evaluate. This is the discipleship part, right? You're giving feedback. Um, I think one of the models we could look at is in Luke 10 and 1 through 23. Remember, Jesus sends out the 72 and afterwards he has like a debriefing with them. He sends them out. They're doing all this stuff in his power. He's equipped them for it. And they come back and they tell him all about it. And he does a little debrief. He's discipling them because they were his disciples. And I think we can apply some of those same things to our discipleship as well and find that delegation is not a necessary evil. It's not a way to slough off something you're supposed to be doing. No, it's discipleship and it's an opportunity to lead, to multiply, to build someone up. And a lot of people out there are craving this sort of um, someone to to believe in them, to equip them, and to say, here is a mantle of responsibility. Take it, run with it. I'm going to give you pointers as you go, but I believe in you. It's a huge opportunity to serve people by also serving yourself in, in equipping people to do things that you don't necessarily have the time to do anymore. So delegation, it's discipleship. Highly recommended for you. And I recommend it for myself too. Again, I am learning. I am learning. Okay, so uh, that's the, the first part of the show. We're talking about delegation. I'm going to next talk about the question of the week, which is how do you stay productive with little kids? This is one I've been getting a lot lately since I've announced the birth of our third baby. I've had a couple of rounds of doing this with newborns in the house, and I'm going to answer that. I'm also going to give you a productivity tip of the week, just something really practical. So we'll do that in a second after this word from our sponsor. Pornography is not a comfortable subject, but did you know that seven out of 10 men and one out of three women in the church today are struggling with pornography? It is the secret sin that no one really wants to talk about. And if porn is impacting your life or the life of someone you know, there is hope. You can begin a life of accountability and a journey toward freedom today. You know, we all need biblical accountability, and by walking that path, you can have peace of mind knowing that you are not alone in the fight. 
And that's how Covenant Eyes works, through accountability. When you sign up, you'll choose an ally who will receive your device reports and walk with you toward a life free from porn and the life that God desires for you. You can try Covenant Eyes free for 30 days by visiting CovenantEyes.com and using the promo code ROSE at checkout. That's ROSE, like the flower, like my last name, R-O-S-E. So go to CovenantEyes.com, use the promo code ROSE at checkout for 30 days free. Don't let shame keep you from the life that God has for you. Take back your life, your marriage, and your relationships. Freedom and healing can begin today. I recommend Covenant Eyes because it is useful. It has been useful for me. It's useful in many people's lives that I know. And it's just a great way to fight digital fire with fire. If uh, you're struggling, you have secret sin, you're, you're kind of keeping on your devices. You need something on your devices that's going to help shed some light on that. So you can go to the Lord in repentance, but also go to your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ so that they can help you be accountable, help see if you are getting into things that you ought not to be. Let's do the question of the week. So this is a new segment, and hopefully we'll be adding to this in future episodes. I've had a lot of questions over the years. I have like a big bank of questions that I could answer for a while, but I would like to answer new questions as they come in. So if you would like to participate in this segment in the future, you can send me a question, like a productivity-related question, to reagan at redeemingproductivity.com, and perhaps you will be featured in a future episode. So this week's question is, how do you stay productive with little kids? Um, getting a lot of this because we just had little Henry just two weeks ago, actually, and um, that's pretty disruptive to your productivity. And so I'm not claiming to be an expert on kids. I think we've been pretty lucky with um, R3 that it's been pretty nice to be able to slip back into old rhythms rather quickly. But uh, I do have three kids under four right now, and one of them is literally a two-week-old, and it does affect your productivity. I want to show you some of the ways that I help counteract that a little bit, okay? So I'd say the first thing is, how do you stay productive if you got little kids? First is just accept that life has changed and you're not going to be as productive as before. I think a lot of times we get in our heads that there has to be this like baseline. I'm going to be this productive. It's going to be a, a 10 out of 10 all the time for my whole life. No, it's not. It's not. There's seasons of life where you have other responsibilities that get really high. And that means your work or some other area has to shift. We talk about in the academy, this concept of domains of stewardship and that you basically have these different areas that you're responsible for in your life. And I like to picture it as a pie graph, right? And so maybe you have six areas of responsibility. You have your home, you have your um, health, you have your job, you have your church, right? All those things. Well, they're not going to be six even slices if the size of the pie slice is representative of how much time is dedicated to them. Um, your work is going to take up an inordinate amount of your time every day. That's normal. But in different seasons of life, other pieces of that pie, other domains of stewardship will expand and they will eat into other areas. Your productivity in work is going to go down when you have little kids in the house. It's just a fact. You're not sleeping as much. You're probably going to have to take a little bit of time off. You ought to, if you can, to be with them. Like That's just a fact. And that's okay. This is true of other things too. I've talked to people um, with chronic health conditions that affect their work. And they say, well, how am I supposed to be productive with this? It's like, by not putting on yourself that you're supposed to be as productive as you were before you had that, or even to compare yourself with someone else. You simply accept that I want to be a faithful steward of the time that I do have. I'm going to be as faithful as I can be because things have shifted. So that's the first thing. Just accept it. Things are going to be rough if you have little kids, and especially right at the beginning with a newborn. Um, I'm living that right now. Okay. <laughs> the other thing is, uh, this has been really helpful for my wife and I, and that is making a plan for how we're going to split the responsibilities. I know that for a lot of couples, having a newborn baby is kind of a source of tension in the house because um, maybe if your wife is a stay-at-home mom or even if she's like on maternity leave, but you can't do paternity leave because your job doesn't let you and you have to be working, and then you're trying to do 50-50, waking up and changing the baby and doing those things in the night, People can kind of get frustrated with each other. It's like, well, I'm working all day. And, and well, I'm trying to recover from, you know, pushing a baby out of my body, right? Um, having those discussions with your spouse 
are super helpful because then again, it, I guess it relates to the delegation thing, but then you're on the same page. You're kind of like, I have clarity over what I'm supposed to be doing. And it, when there's flexion from those main things, that's, that's fine. But just kind of setting a baseline, what is it each of us is going to do? So with, with my wife, thankfully, when she had our first, she went to being um, a full-time homemaker, stay-at-home mom. And so from the start, she initiated the thing of after the first couple of weeks, she said, I will wake up, I will do the diapers, I will feed him in the night. You sleep because you're going to have to go back to work the next day. And that has worked really well for us for all of our babies so far. Obviously, that's not like a hard and fast rule. Sometimes she's just zonked and I do do it. And she says, can you help me? Yes, I'd love to, right? Or even right now, she's, she's under the weather. And so I was doing more diapers and things during the night. And that's fine. But having those kind of set, here's what I'm going to do, here's what you're going to do type things, that discussion, that I think has been probably the biggest factor in me being able to get back to work rather quickly and like back to being fully focused. That said, um, with all three of our kids, I did take time off. I think the first one I took two weeks off of work to be with her. None of the jobs I've had have had paternity leave. I know some people have that option. And with the last two kids, I was working from for myself um, freelance with the last one and then now just working with Redeeming Productivity. And so I had, I mean, I don't have vacation days except for you know, the days I want to take off and feel worried that things are going to fall apart while I'm not working. But um, I took a, a week off for the last two, like completely off, and then kind of did like part-time-ish type stuff for the next week. And th those are the first two weeks. And by that point, we were kind of, again, communicating. We kind of figured out, I was saying, okay, I'm feeling ready. Let's, you can go back and, and go back and ramp up to full-time. That discussion, that stuff, really helpful. Uh Another thing, being productive with little kids, so not just babies, early bedtimes. I know people are different on this stuff. My wife and I go to bed really early, like 9, 930. And so we put our kids to bed at seven o'clock. I'm dreading the day when our kids get older and like are not going to go to that. Like I talk to friends who have teenagers and like my kids go to bed at like midnight. I'm like, oh no, what will happen to my precious morning routine? But um, early bedtimes right now, that's huge for us. Why? It means that my wife and I have more time together in the evening after the kids are asleep. And it also means I can still wake up early, do my morning routine, and everything still be kind of copacetic. With that said, I know a lot of you have followed my program Power Mornings, whether it's from reading the book, Reading Meaning Productivity, or taking the course on it, and you're saying, okay, I know you're big on morning routines. Do you just keep doing that? Do you keep getting up at 4, 4 30, 5 30? I'm like, no, I don't. <laughs> in the first couple of weeks, uh, we're in week three now from Henry being born. And, uh, I'm still not back up to 4.30 because I'm not sleeping as much. So I let that stuff flex. I'm fine with that. I recognize that that habit is probably going to go down uh, for a while and I'm going to have to rebuild it later. This is, again, this is that accepting things are going to be rough for a little while with kids. So at the same time, the morning routine with all three of my kids has been my sort of, um, it's the thing that's kind of kept me sane, <laughs> I guess. Um, being able to have time before the kids wake up, where I have some time to myself to read, be in the word, to pray, to plan my day, to do even writing, that kind of stuff. Having that morning routine is like the only thing that keeps me sane some days because the days when the kids are crazy and stuff's going nuts or even when I'm not sleeping well, knowing that I'm, I'm going to wake up a little bit earlier, I'm, I'm happy to sacrifice a little bit of sleep during those weeks to, uh, to have that precious time by myself and with the Lord. So those are just a couple of ideas. Maybe something in there will be useful for you. That's how do I stay productive while having little kids in the house. Again, um, I'd love if you would be interested in asking a question, a productivity-related question. Send it to Reagan at redeemingproductivity.com and perhaps it will be featured in a future episode. All right, and the very last thing I want to talk to you about before uh, we end the episode is the productivity tip of the week. That's the productivity tip of the week. I need to come up with a little uh, theme song for this. So I shared in my newsletter last week, which by the way, if you don't get the newsletter, it's called Reagan's Roundup. It has a bunch of productivity resources. I send out every single week. Sometimes it's got articles. I link to other people's podcasts, just different stuff I think is going to be helpful. And sometimes it has tips in there to help you be more productive. And I shared one tip in that that I got a lot of feedback on. Last week, I shared about if you're working on a Mac, how you can 
quickly, easily, and for free remove the background from an image. This comes up for me all the time working on, you know, doing thumbnails for podcasts, but a surprising amount of time people just want to isolate the person in an image from the background. Well, there's actually several ways you can do this for free. You don't need Photoshop. You don't need to pay some AI wizard to do it. There's a few tools. I want to show you three ways to do it that are going to uh, make your life 10 times better. <laughs> it's a money back guarantee. So the first one is the one I mentioned in the article. If you are on a Mac, I'm going to tell you something that is going to save you a lot of time. If you go to any image, you right click on it and you select the menu that says quick actions, there will be a uh, option to remove background. There's actually several things under the quick actions menu. You can rotate an image, you can mark it up like you can write on it. Um, you can turn any image into a PDF or you can convert it to a different style or you can remove the background. And in one click, you will isolate whoever, the, whatever the main subject is from the background. And it does a pretty stinking good job. That is in, I think, anything from Mac OS, Monterey and up. So that's a fast one. But there's a couple other ways. The other one is a, a website I'll share with you called Tiny Wow. I use this for everything. And this is the bonus tip because there are productivity tools on this website you can use for anything. This is totally free. You don't even have to sign up. But they have tools for working with files, tools for converting, editing PDFs, things for video, uh, even writing things. But some of their most popular ones is removing the background from an image. You can upload an image to this website. Again, that's tinywow.com, and it will remove the background. You can merge two PDFs together, JPEG to PDF. There's a bunch of stuff on here and a bunch of AI tools too. Really cool, really awesome, free thing. You bookmark it, tinywow.com. It will, anytime you have a question, you're like, how do I turn this into a PDF or something? This is, website's going to save you a lot of trouble. And I'll share one more way to remove the background from an image. And this one is on your iPhone, if you're on an iPhone. I'll put my phone up on the screen. Okay, there's actually two ways to do this, but if you are in the Photos app on your phone and you have taken a, I think it, it has to be a portrait photo, I think. It may work with live photos too, but I think it works best with portrait photos. You can long press on the subject of an image. So in this one, it's my son throwing leaves up in the air. And you see how he like shimmered a little bit when I did that? And then this menu pops up to copy. And I can copy that image. And I can do a lot of stuff with it. I could go over to iMessage and I could just paste it in. See how he's isolated. I can uh, share it to anybody, anything I want to do that. I could send it over to my computer right there if I wanted to. The other thing you can do is in Safari, you can do a very similar thing. You can go find an image on the web in mobile Safari. Here's a cat. I don't know why. If you, again, long press on it, it doesn't shimmer like the other one, but you can go down and click this thing that says copy subject. And again, I'll show you, that's on my clipboard. If I go back over to iMessages, just as an example, I can paste it in and look, there's no background on that image. Go back, see how it did have that background, the carpet, whatever that stuff is back there. It is gone. Again, that's just built in. I had no idea that, it, that you could do this stuff <laughs> until recently. But that'll save you a ton of time if you work with images and you're trying to um, remove the background and you hate Photoshop or don't want to pay whatever ridiculous price Photoshop costs nowadays. All right, that's all I've got for this week. Thank you so much for listening or watching. If you do enjoy the show, please do subscribe, whether you're on a podcast player or on YouTube. It's great to have you. You won't miss an episode after you do that. And uh, I will be here again with you next week. But until I do, please remember this in whatever you do. Do it well and do it all for the glory of God.